here's my last minute IGCSE LXL biology kind of notes or tips that I want to share with you. That paper is going to start with a long passage and I recommend that you answer the long passage question last. Why? Because it will give you the time to pick through it carefully because you'll have quite a lot of time left over, I imagine, by the time you finish the paper. And that will give you the time to read that passage properly. Whereas if you start with that passage, you're going to skim through and probably not have a clue what's going on. Okay, so let's go through some quick notes then. This is me just saying paper two content as concisely and quickly as possible. So remember, protein synthesis occurs in two stages, transcription, which remember occurs in the nucleus. This is very brief. Remember what happens here is the DNA unwinds and single-stranded mRNA is made. For more in-depth overview, you need to look at my all-in-ones. The next stage is translation. Always point out where these things are happening. It's in the ribosome, codons on mRNA are complementary to anticodons on tRNA. Amino acids join to form a protein. In terms of mutations, remember that a mutation is a random change in the DNA. If that random change includes a addition or deletion of base, what's gonna happen then is you're gonna have a different sequence of amino acids brought to the ribosome which will give you a different protein with a different phenotype. So if that protein is used to make an enzyme, it means that the enzyme's active site changes shape, meaning that the substrate no longer fits. If you have a substitution, that means when one base is swapped for another, there may not be a change in the amino acid sequence. There could well be, but it's less likely compared with an additional deletion. So you could potentially have the same protein with the same phenotype. Let's talk about the effect of pH on enzyme activity. They like to often ask you about amylase here. And for this experiment, just think that it breaks down starch into glucose. I know it breaks it down into maltose, but it will make it far more straightforward in an experimental situation because remember you can therefore monitor this reaction by looking at iodine because that will be blue black in the presence of starch it will be orange in the presence of glucose or they could ask you about benedicts in order to monitor this so be aware of all your colors in the presence of starch benedicts will be blue and in the presence of that glucose, it will be brick red. So you'll know, based on how quickly that color changes to brick red, you would therefore predict that the pH is optimal for the enzyme amylase to catalyze the breakdown of starch to glucose. What about the nitrogen cycle? Again, very concise notes here. So nitrates, remember these are ions, they're absorbed into the root hair cells. Make sure you write that fully. Don't just say roots. How? By active transport. To get an extra mark, define active transport. You want to talk about the fact that the plants and animals die and they're decayed by decomposers. Then you have the step of nitrification, which is carried out by nitrifying bacteria. You must learn exactly what these do. They convert ammonium ions 
into nitrites. Make sure you spell this correctly. And then lastly, nitrates, which is a good thing because those plants want the nitrates to make proteins from. The denitrifying bacteria are super annoying because they do the opposite role and they convert nitrates to nitrogen gas, which is super annoying because nitrogen gas is inert. And then lastly, nitrogen fixation can occur by lightning. So when lightning strikes the ground, as well as nitrogen fixing bacteria, name them, which are found on root nodules of leguminous plants, such as peas and beans. And they're gonna take that nitrogen gas and convert it directly to nitrates. So again, they will increase the fertility of the soil. Again, there's more detail you can add, but this is an extremely concise video if you're just wanting to top up your paper to knowledge. We'll touch on the kidney. It has two functions. One is excretion of what substance? Of urea. The second role is osmoregulation, which means control of blood water levels. If they ask you about excretion, you're going to talk about ultrafiltration, which, remember, occurs at the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. This is when small molecules such as ions, water, glucose, urea, enter the Bowman's capsule. Make sure you can label that nephron. So we can see here how excretion is taking place because the urea moves from the blood in the glomerulus into the kidney nephron, which it continues down the route of the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. Don't forget about selective reabsorption. Remember that occurs in the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule, and that occurs by active transport. So as the name suggests, that's when useful molecules are returned to the blood, such as ions and glucose. The last thing we want to do is lose these things in our urine. And any presence of glucose or protein can indicate issues. It can indicate that the PCT is not working to selectively reabsorb the glucose. Any protein present will indicate damage to the Bowman's capsule because remember, proteins are too large to enter the nephron. Osmoregulation, remember, is all to do with the hormone ADH. Do make sure that you are aware that water levels are detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. That the pituitary gland releases ADH that that ADH acts on the kidney's collecting duct, altering its permeability. So if we were to take a scenario where we haven't had a lot of water to drink, it means that osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus would detect low water levels. The pituitary gland releases lots of ADH. The collecting duct walls are more permeable, meaning more water is reabsorbed back into the blood meaning that less water is available to make urine. I don't want to make this a long video, but just to touch on the menstrual cycle. Remember LH and FSH. The role of these hormones is to mature the egg in the ovary. LH is responsible for ovulation which is the release of an egg. It's worth learning what happens in terms of whether they inhibit or stimulate estrogen and progesterone production. Again, watch my all-in-one if you're not sure. Remember that they're letter hormones, which means, like ADH, they're made in the pituitary gland. So I hope you found this super helpful. Yeah, you guys are doing super well. I know it's been a long, old journey, but last push, you can do it.